morning, everyone. So let's see, last time we were talking about um, reactions, what happens in reactors in particular, the kind of the hydrolo hydraulics, hydrology of the reactors themselves. Um, today I want to come back to kinetics a little bit and expand um, on how we know what a reaction is looking like. This applies to more than just chemical reactions, but chemical reactions are sort of our starting point to to take a look at, you know, okay, what, how do we know when and to what extent a reaction is going to happen? Um, so we'll see parallels between uh, chemical reactions and physical or biological or other, um, and we'll, we'll kind of build from a basis where you know, and on the terms of chemistry, we usually have two molecules that are interacting. So we have chemical reactions driven by specific collisions of uh, reactants to form some sort of product. So we're going to take a look at uh, the fundamentals of the kinetic analyses and then ultimately come back to the point where we, we actually talked a couple times ago about how to look at or how to find K in a system and elaborate a little bit there. And then I also want to um, just give a couple notes on the critical review assignment that's been posted now um, to give you a, few, a couple tips and answer any questions and um, maybe clarify a couple of the expectations there. So we'll get to that kind of a, at the end. <clears throat> okay, so for our fundamental reactions, uh, ultimately our goal in terms of mass balance is again to, to really just understand how a mass or a concentration is changing, moving, transforming, whatever through a system or inside a system. And so the reaction term is really going to be that component that's within a system and the end goal is to understand how the reaction is changing that stuff and how we can know about the reaction given observations. So we, we can look at it two different ways. If we have some prior knowledge, then we can apply that prior knowledge given these tools, or we can learn something about the reaction by doing an experiment if we understand these tools. Okay, so in terms of a, a stoichiometric basis for reactions, we can take a look at um, essentially some reactant A with reactant with a reactant B in in terms of the numbers we have there. So we'll say reactants and products, P for products. And certainly we, we can have multiple products, but this is um, the important part in terms of understanding the kinetics is going to be understanding how many reactants we have combining. Um, so we can lo look at it, if this was a chemical reaction, we have lowercase a number of molecules of molecule type A plus B of B molecules yields P of P products. So in terms of um, you know just chemical reactions, it's very simple. We've seen that over and over again. But in terms of how that translates into the rate of something changing, we can make a relationship between, okay, maybe we are only able to observe the reactant B. The reactant A is, you know, so, so little amount of it or so hard to detect for whatever reason that we can only observe B. But we want to know about A. So if we can observe B, then we can, we can understand A by making a relationship here with um, the rate at which A changes, so the, uh, ultimately we can, we can make this relationship by saying that negative, so negative because the rate here, rate of A, if we're making products, A is going to be decreasing. So the, the negative rate at which A changes times 1 over A, so kind of basically dividing by the number of molecules there, is going to be equal to that same setup for B, or it's also equal to 1 over P times the rate that P is changing. So it's very, um, 
in a way that's very uh, obvious, right? It's A changes, if A is being removed, then P is being added. Um, but that's one of the mass balances we can use, and we, we just need to take the one over that um, prefix number. We can rearrange that if we want to solve for the rate of A, for example, um, multiply everything by negative A, and we would say R of A is equal to A over B R B, and that's also equal to negative A over P R P. So this is a, a very simple um, way to look at if we have one known rate, then we can know the others based on this principle here. So I'm just going to say sometimes Sometimes one species is the only known. Or the only one we are observing. And that's why this is particularly important so that we can we can make that connection. Okay. So there's an example problem. I figured we'd go ahead and dive into it. This is uh, from our book, example 3.1. <coughs> it asks, um, so it says hexavalent chromium, uh, or CR in the plus 6 oxidation state, CR6, is found in many industrial wastes at substantial concentrations and is a trace contaminant in some groundwater. And the treatment of these wastes often involves the reduction of CR6 to trivalent, CR3, which, uh, in which state the metal is very likely to precipitate as chromium hydroxide, CrOH3, a solid. This treatment approach is attractive in both, uh, for both because the trivalent chromium is much less of a health hazard than uh, the hexavalent mostly because it's that, that solid form, um, or it tends towards precipitating as a solid. And because the precipitation can be removed from the system by settling and or filtration. Okay, so the, so the uh, trivalent is less toxic and much easier to, to remove from the system. So the dominant form of chromium-6 is mildly acidic, uh, dilute wastes in um, Dilute, dilute, uh, let's see. Excuse me. The dominant form of chromium 6 in mildly acidic dilute wastes is as bichromate ion HCrO4 minus. Reaction of this with Fe2 plus, so ferrous ions, can generate um, the CrOH3 solid. And also generates FeOH3 solids. By this reaction, we have the that bichromate ion plus the three ferrous ions plus eight waters yields three of these iron hydroxy solid and the CrOH3 solid and five protons, so making some acid there. So the question here is, a, how are the rates of this reaction um, of HCrO4 minus, Fe2 plus, and H plus related to one another? So essentially, you know, taking a, taking a look at that on a reaction basis we were just looking at, how do those compare? And B, if the rate of that HCrO4 minus by this reaction is negative 10 to the fifth moles per liter per second, what is the rate of the alkalinity uh, at which the alkalinity is being destroyed by the reaction in equivalents per liter? And then there's a, a note here that says each mole of H plus destroys one equivalent of alkalinity. 
So give that a moment. See if you can come up with the, the answers there. We can set up that relationships with some sort of uh, something before each of these here, but set it up as those equivalents like we were just looking at a minute ago for part. Really, for this problem, what we're interested in here for this uh, the stoichiometry, we don't really need the waters there. Um, that's not not important in terms of the relationships that we're looking at. And typically, we're not going to be looking at the um, the rate at which water is changing because that's there's just so much water that it's going to be a negligible change for something dissolved in water. Um, okay, so in this case, then we could write um, you know we have one of this HrCO4 minus molecule, and we'll call that A. We have three uh, ferrous ions, we'll call that B. And then hydrogen was the last one that we're looking at, we'll call that 
um, our product. So that's why we can go ahead and just write it up like this, and then we can say, uh, like we saw a moment ago, if we take one over you know, that one over a times the rate of which a changes, um, we can relate that to one over b and minus one over p. Um, but then we can multiply everything by the a. The small a was just one, so essentially we are left with the 1 over 3 here and negative 1 over 5 here. So that hopefully is pretty straightforward. And then part B, we have, um, you know, we said that, okay, if this HRCO4 minus by this reaction is this guy is changing at negative 10 to the minus fifth moles per liter per second. Then the question is, what is the rate of alkalinity changing? So R of alkalinity. So the rate at which that's being destroyed is going to be the, the negative of the H plus being produced. So this should be negative um, that R of H plus. Um, and this was a one-to-one -one relationship. They said each mole of H plus is produced, destroys one equivalent of alkal alkalinity. So then we, we need to use, so that, that's one-to-one -one here. So that should be fine there. Now, then we need to relate this, um, this guy to our H plus and then make that relationship over to the alkalinity. So the rate at which the alkalinity is being destroyed then should be essentially negative um, and then we, we'll, we'll need to rewrite this H so we'll say R at which H is changing is equal to negative 5 times the rate that HR C, oh, excuse me, HCR. O4 minus is changing. So that was just a manipulation here, multiplying both sides by negative five. Okay, so then with this connection and this connection, we should have that rate of alkalinity changing as five times 10 to the minus fifth moles per liter per second. So we'll double check that that's how the book explains it. Um, I might have flipped the minus sign there. Okay. So yeah, part, part A was fine. Part B here it's defining the the rate here like we did. RH is plus 5 times 10 to the minus 5th since one equivalent is destroyed. They made that relationship R of alkalinity is equal to negative R there which is equal to negative 5 times 10 to the minus. So I think I added a negative in there on accident somewhere. But essentially, the, the point is that since alkalinity is being destroyed, this needs to be a negative. So, and I guess because we were removing, let's see, did I, did I include that negative? Yeah, I did. Does anyone see where I did the negative wrong? This, this needs to have a negative, but I accidentally got rid of it somewhere. Right here? Well, so we went from here, so we related this guy to, um, to R sub H, right? So this was by, by this relationship, okay? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I didn't. So we had. Um, okay, so so which it's right here that needs to yeah, be the positive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, okay, yeah, because it didn't, or or at it least it, it would have been negative, and then there's a negative inside here, right? So then there's a so this then r of h plus should equal positive um, five times ten to the minus fifth yeah okay thanks all right okay so that makes sense then um, and that does make sense the alkalinity is decreasing when we're producing the, the acid okay so again that should be pretty straightforward I just wanted to use this example because it was simple and it kind of explicitly shows how we can make that relationship and how we can do that uh, very fundamental aspect of kinetic analysis. Oh, yeah, I have the solution here. Okay. Okay. So, next thing about um, about the terminology, uh, we will often talk about elementary reactions, and you probably have heard this um, before. But essentially, in elementary reactions, just like we were just looking at, it's a a sequence of molecular collisions that converts reactants to products. So essentially we have A plus B yields the product. So when these two combine, you get a product. There's no intermediates, there's no, um, there's no things that um, need to happen between those reactions touching each other and the product forming. So that's the simple one that's not actually very typical. So um, most, most reactions in reality are non-elementary, meaning there's some sort of intermediates, there's something else going on. Um, so we'll say not often uh, descriptive. Now, certainly there are some. Um, there's probably lots of simple things like dissolving salt in water, kind of go from one to the other, and that's that's that. Um, but most cases are going to be non-elementary, so that means we have multiple elementary reactions we can consider, and the net product is you know might look like a simple reaction from A and B to P. But really, there's lots of steps in the way. And to actually properly model and understand the kinetics, we need to know the, the elementary steps along the way, because um, that's our, our tool set gives us this A plus B to P. Um, and that's, that's really the, the way we need to approach it. And then we, we build more complicated models based on building multiple of those ones. Okay, so it, it could be a series of sequential steps, and I got this little car manufacturing plant picture here to as an example. If we uh, are considering, you know, adding a door to the car as one reaction, um, that's maybe one elementary reaction is sticking the door onto the hinges and you know putting it there. Um, that's part of building the car, but it's not suddenly a car because it now has a door on it, right? Um, there's lots of many, many elementary steps and you know maybe maybe the same concept is uh, helpful to an assembly line uh, designer or uh, something like that where we can we can consider rather than you know trying to build a, a car completely from scratch and one person building the entire car you train one person in one step right one elementary step or maybe two and that's the uh, concept of the assembly line right the that you hone in on just one task for somebody to be really effective at, or in this case, maybe one robot to, to have trained to do that. And then, um, you know, you, you have that assessment, you maximize that particular rate, um, rate at which that one task is being performed. So um, 
we can use that that analogy might be helpful for us to understand, you know, okay, maybe we have a bottleneck in our, our reaction and that slowest part is gonna be what um, controls the overall rate that we were producing the product. Okay. So then I wanna talk about these elementary reactions. A few assumptions we're gonna use, um, essentially there's there's three types, so immediately the, your uh, attention probably here is drawn to the, uh, the GIFs being shown. And essentially we could have a monomolecular reaction where a molecule is just simply unstable and decides to react um, with itself. Could have a bimolecular reaction, this is going to be the most common. This is what our assumption is going to be, where we have A and B coming together and when they do, get that reaction and form the products. There are trimolecular reactions. These are uncommon and rather improbable. I mean, the case where we had A plus B plus the water, I guess maybe you could consider that, and then that's gonna be probable because it's in solution with water. Um, but otherwise, it, there are some rare cases where um, you have three reactants that all need to combine for a trimolecular reaction, but the, the probability of having that happen um, is just pretty low um, in, let's say, a, a gas phase where the gas itself is not, um, or I mean, even if the gas is the reactant, it's just rare to have that happen perfectly like that. So essentially, we're gonna ignore these guys and just consider the bimolecular reaction. Okay, this is also, in terms of the elementary reactions, we're also gonna assume no intermediates. We'll um, talk a little bit about intermediates in a moment, um, but given these assumptions, we can then start describing our system and say, our reaction of some species I, um, we call that R sub I, like we've kind of already done. Then we wanna know the activity of I. So in a sense, a concentration is great, but if that concentration, um, maybe we have a very low temperature or something, and there's just not much thermal energy, not much diffusion of the, the something, um, and you can also think here about non-chemical reactions. Maybe there's some reason that this, uh, this object, this something is not very active in the system, so it's not, it, we don't, get the same amount of reaction occurring um, based on the, the amount we have there as if we change some other condition like the temperature. So that um, the activity coefficient here um, gives us a way of better understanding that. So rather than write the, the molar concentration in the brackets, we can use these curly brackets and say that activity um, this is like the effective concentration. So the activity coefficient then decreases the, um, you know, it would go to from zero to one typically, where it's at most, it's as active as our concentration is. But sometimes maybe it'll be 0.95 or something like that. And so we can, we can describe the activity of A um, in this manner. So then we, we also have a temperature dependent reaction rate constant, so K prime. So with this, we have, um, we have some way to describe our rate of I, and this is gonna equate in some way to that activity <coughs> and our K prime. So that's what we're, what we're kind of looking at in terms of what's what our equations are going to be. So here we have this uh, K prime, and I think I meant to make that subscripted. Yeah, sorry, this was intended for this to be subscripted, so I'm gonna change that real quick.
So we have k prime with this activity of A and activity of B um, for that reaction. So we're going to equate that to negative k prime and essentially we're going to and you know what maybe they're not even supposed to be subscript maybe that's just part of it I'll, I'll fix this these slides and I'll come back later um, and I'll, I'll make a note when I post these slides so I think what's going on here is it should be negative k prime just times that activity a times the activity B and I've confused myself with my notes and I apologize so we'll take a look at the book in a minute um, so essentially what we're gonna do then is describe that activity so this was the that a sub a here so the activity of a and we're gonna we're taking this um, reaction to be k prime, so negative k prime times the activity of A times the activity of B equals that negative k prime, and then here we're expanding, okay, what does A mean, what, what does the activity of A mean and the activity of B? And here we get into this activity coefficient, that, um, I guess that's a gamma A, times the concentration of A, and then we have to divide the concentration of A at standard state. So essentially, we're comparing the concentration of A that we observe um, in the current condition com and compare that to what it's at in kind of the ideal or standard state type of chemistry. So we don't, not wanting to get lost here with all this stuff I'm just elaborating on what that what that meant to, to be considering the activity and you could you could learn more about that recall more from chemistry but essentially we have both components there the activity of A and the activity of B um, so that's what that part is in that okay but from there we're, we're just going to simplify um, and if we if we make some um, assumptions, we can get to the point where k we, we simplify for k instead of k prime, so that the rate at which a is changing is equal to the rate at which b is changing, which is the negative rate at which p is changing. So back to our well, kind of where we started with that. And in this case, we can define those as negative k times the concentration. So this k then um, essentially accounts for activity. And in a lot of cases, if you're reading a paper or something, you see a k like this that they've derived. A lot of times this is actually going to be that k observed, right? So we observe this reaction and then maybe some chemists will go in and say, okay, well, let's compare that to the standard state. Like, what's the activity here? Let's refine this and say, okay, exactly what this, what we expect this reaction to be doing in, you know, in that ideal or in that precisely controlled theoretical state. Um, so there's certainly some steps we need to take between the, hey, I, I did this reaction in lab. This is how fast it went here. Here's what I think the kinetics are to, okay, what would we write into a textbook as the definitive rate constant for this reaction? So there's, there's some um, analysis and uh, changes that, that are needed there, but um, tip, you know, in a lot of cases, they're not too far off. Okay, so then we have an idea of what K accounts for and where it goes into our equations. Um, how, how they describe our rates. Um, how can we know uh, more about K? Uh, maybe we, we have a system and we, um, we don't know where to start. Well, there's a, there's a couple of ways, right? So, and for chemistry in particular, we have either diffusion controlled, so that's, uh, or diffusion limited, so the reactions are going to occur 
um, essentially as fast as the molecules collide. Um, so we call those diffusion-limited reactions. Then sometimes they happen slower. We have plenty of molecules colliding, but it's just not, um, not quite that fast, and that's due to maybe chemical thermodynamics. Maybe that's due to, you know, in a system where we have physical particles sticking together, maybe they're just not quite sticky enough, and so sometimes they collide but don't stick, um, so only some fraction of them stick together. Um, in terms of chemistry, we have uh, some, some aspect here where a lot of times we have this activation energy requirement where we have the energy level from the product or from the reactants to the products is only this high, but the reaction only ever takes place when you overcome that activation energy, and so um, maybe you need to add more energy to the system or only the molecules that happen to be on the more energetic side of the spectrum, you know, the vibrational energy, the, the temperature, um, I believe that molecules are going to be vibrating. You can, the, uh, you could compare the temperature of a given molecule and there, there's going to be some normal distribution. Some of them are vibrating more vigorously or happen to be more energetic at some moment. Um, those ones will be the ones to react. And so only a portion of your reactions goes forward, that slows down the reaction. So as you're waiting for the, those moments where two energetic molecules collide, that's, um, that's driving your, your products. Okay, so for, for those, we have the, the thermodynamics involved and we have um, the Arrhenius equation here that describes the rate at, the rate constant for two different temperatures, we'll say T2 and T1, is described with this system. And then, you know, if you remember from chemistry, got um, the energy term and some constants, and then kind of some differential between those two temperatures. And with that, we can know a little bit more about um, what is K and how does K depend on temperature. So that's, a, that's one tool we can use. And one thing we can do with it is check the, um, check an experiment at two different temperatures and then derive from there that temperature dependency and learn about K in that manner. So we, we can use that as a tool. Um, again, this not, the point here is not the chemistry itself, but just to better understand the what's driving our kinetics and how do, how do we practically um, understand that. In the case of, um, so a, let's say coagulation and sedimentation, a physical process, there are similar relationships for the reaction rate constant. So we'll say in coagulation, The K depends on the mixing intensity and the um, particle stability, for example. So that the um, mixing intensity would be in some sense like the, um, like the temperature. If you, your mixing intensity is um, too low, the particles aren't going to find each other, right? There's there going to be fewer occasions where they, they collide. Um, and in that case, you know, at some level, you'd probably get too high of a mixing intensity and you'd break the particles back apart. That, that would be kind of a, a separate a reaction we'd have to consider. Actually, that's a pretty good example of two different elementary reactions that would be competing formation of particles, but then the destruction of particles by shear forces. Um, so practically speaking, you'd want to, to avoid the, the breaking of them apart. And that equation was T? 
Do we specify subscript? Because you don't know when you're in time. Yep. So, um, I think this is. I think this T is supposed to be subscripted. So, okay. I'll do that real quick. This is the K at T two. Yeah, K at T two and K at T one, I believe. Yeah. Fix that real quick. Okay. All right. So the next slide here, just have an example of. Um, Non-elementary reactions, this is looking at the formation of disinfection byproducts, either by chlorination or bromination. And essentially, you know, we have all, all these different reactions, lots of intermediates. And the point here is just that, you know, in a real system, when we want to understand something like the disinfection byproduct formation, it can be messy. And then you want to look at um, different reactions, different components, and to describe the whole system thoroughly, you will need each component. Um, sometimes you might be able to identify which, maybe one piece of this is particularly important for some particularly bad outcome or something like that, or maybe the limiting factor, and then do your study on just one or two pieces, but in general, um, you know, this is an example. There's a lot of atmospheric chemistry that happens with lots of intermediates. Um, and, you know, it can be quite comp complicated. So just looking at this figure here, we've got some intermediate plus bromide. Um, this, some substrate reacts, um, goes that way, or we can look at it with the intermediates and chloride. So as we chlorinate on the kind of right end of the spectrum, we can get monochloroacetic acid, dichloroacetic acid, trichloroacetic acid, common disinfection byproducts. Um, um, and if you've ever seen the term halo, um, acetic acid, HAAs, uh, that's kind of what we're talking about, halo. So chloride and bromide both being halogens. Um, and then there's, there's some other products as well. So sometimes you'll have chlorines and bromines added to a system. And so those are, that's what you're seeing kind of in between. So one bromine and two chlorines or two bromines and one chlorine. And so you have have some mixes or sometimes one or the other. So all those things are happening in a system where you've got um, oxidation reactions happening in the presence of chloride and bromide or in um, active chlorine, active bromine situations. Okay, so that's just kind of a, a just elaborate picture that's complex and uh, a good example of all these different reactions and you know, if, you, if you're trying to understand how much of this product you get, then you have to, you have to consider this reaction and this reaction to so understand how much of this you have. You probably need to know that competing reaction, how that compares to this rate, and obviously to get to each of, you know, how much you expect to have of each of these depends on all these other reactions in the system, right? So it, it really does get um, pretty complex. <clears throat> okay, so one thing I want to show here in terms of looking at uh, the simplified terms, if we take a look, overall reaction to be A plus B goes to products, like we were doing at the beginning, that elementary reaction, if this is a non-elementary reaction, then maybe what it looks like is really a plus C goes to D, C plus D goes to E, and then two E's form one B, and then we get A plus B is, goes to the product. And if that's the case, then, you know, 
even in this simple case, you can start to see that, oh, you know, in order to get there in the first place, we have to have A and C. So those might be the two reactants that we actually add together in the first place, um, rather than the A plus B that we were, we were thinking about. So cars plus wheels, you know, a, a car body plus wheels is it's not really what it takes to get the car. You have other components in the middle. Um, so here you also see that you're consuming C to form D, and you're also consuming C to form E, and then you need two E's to form B, right? So that's a lot of C that we're adding compared to the amount of um, A. So we do need A twice. We need A to get D. So we'll say once here and then the second time here. Um, but if we take a look, actually that might be the same amount, but you see where I'm, my, my thoughts are going, right? How much, how much of each do we need will depend on how these are interplaying. And you know, E happening twice means um, we certainly need a lot of that reaction that's forming E, so we need a lot of C and D. Um, so just wanted to kind of elaborate on that a little bit. We could go through and analyze, okay, how much of each of them do we need um, to get to our end point? Um, and I think we need more C here because because we use C in getting D and we use C with D to get E. Okay. Okay, so coming back to finding K empirically. So we, we talked about this, um, I think it was two lectures ago, where we were looking at graphing some data points and maybe we had something we need to linearize and so we could do that. So this table here in the book, table 3.1, is providing us um, the integration of those equations so that, you know, that we could relate to you know, that line. So if we had a natural log plot, for example, we could relate the batch, the batch case, and these are, these are all in a batch reactor. Um, a first order reaction, a decay reaction, would be a linear line on a, a natural log plot, right? That's, we could make that relationship because we were able to derive the, um, we were able to derive the integral here. So if we take a look at, so the order, reaction order is one, so first order. We looked at this and we said the natural log of C over C naught equals minus KT. So this is the um, a table that's essentially giving us those those solutions to the uh, problems. And I mentioned we can do it for a second order. We did it for the, the zero order in the first order. So we've got zero order there, uh, first order here. And then we can do it for a second order, but it's just a little more complicated and I didn't want us to feel like we had to remember the integrals off the top of our head. So if we if we do this, you see they're integrating from dc over c squared instead of dc over over c. So that dc over c was the one that gave us the natural log. So dc over c squared, this one comes out to be 1 over c minus 1 over c naught equals kt. Okay, so that's the, uh, the integration for the second order. And, you know, we could, we could take a look at it um, in another form as just C. So if you simplify for just C, you could have the C equals 1 over C naught plus KT to the negative 1, all that to the negative 1 power. Whereas over here you could have C equals C naught times E to the minus KT. Then you can also have any time where you don't have the reaction order of 1, maybe you have like kind of 1.5 somehow, maybe a, a series of elementary reactions where one of them is zero order and the other is first order. I think that I think that's a case where you would get um, n not equal to one. So you have some rate where you have instead of 
negative kc to the one for a first order, you have kc to the n. We can take this uh, integral and it gives us this generalized form where we have that equation. So that could be um, useful in some cases if you had some sort of reaction that wasn't at first order and you wanted to, to model or understand it. Practically speaking, we're not going to deal with that in the class. And if I were to give you a second order equation um, to work with, I would remind you that this is, this is what we got, or I'll, I would give you the book or something. Um, first order, second order, and zero order, I expect you, sh you should be able to derive on your own, um, should be able to commit those to memory a little bit easier. Uh, anything else for the exam, I would, I would give you the reminder here. But I, would, I just wanted to show you that, um, and it, it gives a little discussion. So it's pretty useful and another kind of another tool in the kinetics um, tool set we've got. And of course, this this also um, will help us understand how it would go into other types of reactors. Um, of course, you have to account for the flow. So, you know the. A second order reaction in a CSTR is going to be a little difficult or a little different. Um, if we have the steady state assumption in place, then um, that probably simplifies things enough. But if you had a non-steady state CSTR, that would that would probably get pretty complicated because you have to do the flows and the the second order reaction term in there. But the batch case is nice, and the plug flow reactor we can essentially treat in a way like a batch reactor, so that's um, pretty nice too. Okay, so any questions on the, the kinetics side of things before we move on? Yeah? I guess you said uh, you might have like a uh, half reaction layer, like 1.5 or something. What, what's an example of that layer? Like how do you determine that it's that order or not in zero, one, or two? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, and I, I should have, um, I, I wished I would have thought and looked up examples for that. I think, I think if you have a non-elementary reaction where you have an intermediate, and let's imagine that the intermediate is a second order reaction, but the, um, the initial reaction is first order, I think the net result is going to be not an integer. Right. I think that would be an example, but I'll, I'm going to try to look that up and get back to you um, with a better answer there. But I, I think that's the case, and sometimes just you do some sort of experiment and you're not sure what's going on, and so it's kind of messy and you, you realize, okay, neither zero, first, or second order is fitting this, so I must have some sort of competing reaction happening, I'm not sure what it is. So I'm going to just model it based on the empirical and see, okay, according to my experience, this is a 1.35 order reaction. Um, and that's the, the model that best fits it. And then maybe there's some other investigation that can be done. Um, it's a good question. I'll, I'll try to have a better answer for you next time. All right. Any other questions? Okay, so for the, the critical review assignment, I wanted to make a couple notes um, and a little bit of a demonstration perhaps. So one thing that I would recommend um, kind of immediately is that you install or consider getting EndNote um, or a similar bibliography citation software. So EndNote is a tool that essentially lets you aggregate and um, use all sorts of uh, references from, um, from a uh, scientific library database sort of thing. So here's just an example of something I've been working on and I'll show you what it can do in a moment, but um, EndNote is uh, free uh, from LSU Tigerware. So if you have not downloaded that, even if you decide not to use it for this class for whatever reason, it's a 
good opportunity to go ahead and get a, a free copy of it in case you want it later. Um, I don't know how I ever wrote any uh, referenced articles or papers without it in the past, but somehow I'm, I managed through high school and most of college before I learned about it. Um, okay, so let me show you what it can do. Well, first of all, how many of you guys know it, use it, familiar with it? Okay, so two of you. Any, how, for the rest of you, have, do you use some other, um, like, citation software? We use the one built into Word. And it's pretty simple. Okay, the one built into Word. Anything, what, are, what are the rest of you use? Anything like it? Mendeley. Yeah, I've heard of that, and so I think that would be one of the parallels. Um, okay, and any other reference software or just do it by hand kind of thing? Or I think I remember way back in high school, I was I used some sort of I think this didn't exist probably, but I I found like some uh, some website that would kind of do it for you, just format it at least for your MLA format or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> just in high school, you just, it was just easy to punch. Learn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I strongly recommend then that you grab EndNote and learn it because first of all, it, it does build, when you install it, it builds into Word. So you have that, uh, an immediate connection there that you can have some control on both sides. And then let's say I want to make some claim about um, radical chemistry in fullerene systems. And I want to support that claim with some references and I decide, you know, this is a good one, this is a good one, uh, these ones are good, and oh, I need that one too. And I want to put those in there, so um, boom, okay, I just did. Now, I have this formatted in kind of a funny way so that doesn't look very good, but if I decide, okay, that's not the format I want, maybe I want, let's say, how does science format theirs? Ah, there we go. So you see all that formatting that just happened for me at a couple clicks of the button. It's, first of all, an impressive amount of formatting done for you. Um, you know, you could do maybe this one. So. You can, you can get into the system and manipulate, okay, I want it to edit this one a little bit so that it's no longer italics or whatever. There's that level of control if you want it, or some defaults that just installing it kind of gives you some set ones. You could look up the formatting for um, some particular journal that you're trying to submit to or that you just find an attractive style and you want to use that in your report. You can, you can do all of that, right? So. I highly, highly recommend it for any research-related tasks, and I, for our task in particular, um, one of my expectations is that you do something to this effect. I'm hoping that you use this opportunity to learn a new skill here, take EndNote, Mendeley, one of the others, um, and familiarize yourself with it. EndNote is not quite as streamlined and convenient as you know, Microsoft Word. Um, there's some issues sometimes if you wanted the journals to abbreviate and those fields aren't in there, so you have to manually add some fields and save and figure out some nitpicky details if you're really, um, really going uh, strong at it. But at the, at the simple level, it's exceptionally convenient. The other thing I want to do is show you if we go to, um, let's say, the LSU library, how do we get new, um, new citations in here? So I'm going to just do kind of a, a Google type search and then I'm also going to go to LSU libraries. Um, I also wanted to talk about Web of Science as a database, so actually we'll We'll show you that. Okay, so I'm just, I just uh, went to the web real quick and I just searched for um, some random article here. Okay, so that we have this article here. It's an ACS article in ACS Energy Letters. Okay, 
So I'm reading this, this abstract and maybe I download the PDF through LSU libraries or something and I'm just trying to understand and I decide I want to cite this. So what do I do? Um, well, almost every journal publication website, no matter the publisher, is going to have a link somewhere that says save citation, export citation, something like that. So then it's a, a matter of finding it and here we have the export. RIS, that, that's one particular um, uh, format and I usually send the citation in abstract and when I do that, boom, it's there. Um, so in order to find, find your articles and add articles into here, you could maybe use EndNote's little search function. I don't tend to use it, um, but anytime you're, you're surfing the web, you can download that file type and EndNote knows, oh, when, when that uh, file type is being downloaded, we send it to EndNote and we add it to whatever library is open and running right now. Um, I don't actually want that one, so I'm deleting it. Now, the other thing we can do is go to the LSU libraries, and of course you could search in the library itself for articles. I don't find that to be a very effective tool, so how many of you know about Web of Science as a database search? Okay, so I did believe most of I've been using Google Scholar a lot. Google Scholar is a, a good one for sure. Um, and a lot of times, let's say when I'm reviewing, a, doing a peer review for an article, a lot of times I'll go to Google first to just type in, okay, almost the same title, pretty much the same title, just to see if this is just kind of a repeat of somebody else's paper. So that's the, the first thing I do when I'm reviewing a, a journal article. Um, well, sometimes it happens later and I'm like, shoot, this should have been the first thing I do. <laughs> okay, so Web of Science is the other go-to for me. There are um, other databases, but Web of Science seems to be uh, one of the best ones. So I, I went to the LC libraries, I clicked the W for Web of Science, you just got to scroll down a little bit. And this, along with... Um, Along with EndNote, this is a very, very useful tool, okay? So Web of Science, it's um, essentially, you know, a database for peer-reviewed um, publications for all intents and purposes. But what we can do here is not just search for the, the typical keywords, but we could also add, if we already knew, like maybe we're, we're looking at some paper and... Um, you know, in fact, maybe I have some papers linked. So one, one thing you can do in, um, in EndNote is you can download the, the citations. Sometimes you can even do it automatically. So when you pull up the field, you've got the paper there and can, can have it linked that way. So it's, um, you can actually store the, the references there as well. So maybe you're in this paper and you're trying to figure out, okay, they, they cite this paper, but they didn't have a title for the paper. They just, you know, some of the journals don't give the title. It's just the authors and the journal and whatever. So it can be kind of annoying sometimes. One thing you can do is search instead of just by topic or title, you go by author and year published and really narrow down your search um, can be very useful that way. So let's say I want, um, like they give an example here. Let's just follow theirs, oil, so we want to maybe include spill and spillage and um, some other form of spill. You can put an asterisk there. So anything that's spill or spillings, um, if spillacious was a word, you, that would find that. Um, and then, you know, Mediterranean. And I don't remember how to spell Mediterranean, so I'm just going to do medit, uh, you know, asterisk. So then you can search, and it's there's 272 results with just that. Okay, so you can. What's also good with this? I want to say, like, because I use, like I was saying, I use Google Scholar a lot, and a lot of times you're searching that way, you find something like on L. Seaver or whatever it's in, you don't have a description. But yeah. if you go on this, if you go on the LSU and search for data, like you can find it on Google Scholar, and be like, okay, 
this is good because I like going to Google Scholar because it shows you everything. Right. You know, it's not stuck to that one thing. So you can kind of look at it all and you find, okay, this one's really good, but I can't access it. So then I just go here. Right. And I search for it and then LSU has access. To it. So, in exactly. So, a lot of times, you know, an LSU doesn't have access to everything, everything. but for most things, the, this will tell you then, okay. Lately, I've been finding the uh, the look up the full text on the Google Scholar doesn't seem to work lately, but there's um, a couple of other buttons here. So if there's a free text available, you can just click that and it should bring you to it. And then that, I could save that PDF there and I have it. You can click this, the LSU Libraries button. That should bring you to a page where it lists some options of um, access points where you can get to it. Or it might just pull you up again. This, this would be... Um, downloading the article itself um, as a PDF. So yeah, most of the articles for, for most, um, most publications that we have, you know, the LC library has subscription to, you can access that way. If you can't, you can always request it from an interlibrary loan. So that, and they're usually pretty fast with that. It might take a day, but you'll get the paper um, and you'll be able to read it that way. So a couple of other cool features here. So let me search for something a little more broad. Let's, um, let's just search for that oil spill. Okay, this one has 15,000 you know, articles. So maybe I want to know what's the most profound, impactful paper that has ever been published in this field? Well, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's a lot of articles to read through to find, to figure out, and you know, how do I know? Well. One of the metrics we use is how many times other people have cited it. And so we can sort by time cited. And you know, surely that some, maybe if the, the biggest paper ever published just half came out last week, it's not gonna be cited enough times to be seen here. But in general, if you're looking for the historic ones, here's one from 2002 that was, you know, has been cited 5,907 times. Okay, that's quite a lot of citations. Crazy. Mm -hmm. And the next one, you can see, and you can see like it's, you know, it's like an exponential uh, thing, right? Right. So the the very top one in, for this search is six thousand, then thousand five hundred, thousand one hundred, and so on. Now the other thing, um, you know, and it, it depends on the date, right? If if this paper had been out for the same amount of time that first one, maybe it has more citations. So maybe you could look at some metric that way. But anyway, the um. The cool thing here is that not only can you search by that, but let's imagine, okay, you, you could use, um, you could search by relevance, default is date, so you could look at the oldest citations, all these tools, but then maybe you want to know, and I'm gonna go back to date for a moment to demonstrate this, um, oops. Maybe you want to know, let's see, let me find, by, let's go by relevance. So here's one with 23 citations. It's been out since 2016. So that's a reasonably well cited paper. It's in Chemosphere. Okay, maybe you're very interested in this particular topic and you want to know a couple things. Okay, who did they cite and who has cited them? Right, so you can, you can get a, um, you can click their citations there to see who cited them? So now you can start looking at, okay, what impact has this paper had? Has anybody critiqued it? Has anybody, um, you know, claimed that this is false? And then you can go read those ones. Um, you can also read which articles they that particular article cited in the paper. Um, now you could you could get there pretty easily by opening up the paper and looking at their references, right? But um, Web of Silence. Web of Science also um, aggregates that. So if you if you were to click on the some given paper, you can see the uh, how many times it has been cited and the references that that particular one cited. And so you can see all these. Now just clicking on one one random other one, you can actually uh, I think there's a tool where you can see the map. Um, I don't remember, but there's, there's some interesting tools where you can you can see okay 
visually who has cited it and, and all that sort of stuff. So I, I tell you all this because when you're doing your, your critical review, one of the things that I would like for you to do is to use those types of tools to explore the relevance of a paper. Okay, so when you are taking a look, you've selected some paper that's interesting to you, you, you are gonna take a close read and see, okay, do the methods, in your opinion, are they robust? Are they, did they use multiple lines of evidence to support what they're claiming? Or is it kind of flimsy and they're just writing some paper to get published? Like, try to see if you can get to that level of discernment, you know. And one thing you, usually if it's a high quality publication with a big high impact factor or whatever, usually it'll be a better paper, but not always. And then you can look at the other side, if it's pretty low, nobody's really citing these papers much from that journal. There's sometimes good papers there, but you could also maybe find some poor quality ones. So just as you go, see if you can get to that point where you can say, hey, just on a fundamental level, it looks to me like they've provided a lot of evidence. You know, these other people that are citing them are um, maybe complementary or at least, you know, saying this is this was an important finding over here Tr sort of get that approach where you're taking a look at what they did who they built from and who's building on onto them like take a that critical level exploratory uh, approach where you're you're really trying to figure out what else has been done in the field um, so maybe they missed some citations that were important and you found like I found this other paper that's like practically the same. Why didn't they cite that one? You know, that's what I what I'm hoping for you to do is build those skills to take that that type of critical literature approach. Um, be good if the the topic was related to our class. Um, that's uh, something that I'd like for you to do is find something that's somehow related. Um, but I'm okay if it's kind of a stretch in how it relates. All right. So that, that's what I wanted to say. Any, any questions about EndNote or Web of Science or anything? If you haven't used it before, it, it, it might just change your life. Especially as you uh, work on other assignments or theses and all that. All right, so if you do end up with questions along the way, happy to try to help answer. As you see, I can relatively easy, easily demonstrate it for you and happy, for, happy to, to try to help you with that. All right, so that's it. We'll see you guys on Thursday.